Thank you. Thank you, Governors. Well, and I hope all had a, a good evening and good morning. I now ask the, the, the Governor-elect, the Prime Minister for St. Lucia, uh, who have taken his seat beside me uh, to, to bring the resolution of appreciation and, and, and uh, his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, governors. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased and honored to accept the chairmanship of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank on behalf of the government and people of St. Lucia for the year 2022 to 2023. I, ex I accept with humility and promise to use my best efforts to promote the goals and mission of this August regional institution. Let me thank the outgoing chairman, Chief Minister, Honorable Charles W. Missick, for his capable tenure as chairman last year and for the hosting of this conference. Governors, directors, and delegates, in my meeting with Dr. Jean Leon, president of the CDB earlier this year, I informed him that the government of St. Lucia was extremely pleased with the development path that the CDB has been advocating in the region. To my mind, it was a path to build resilience in a holistic way to help the people of the region fulfill the commitments of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I urge the president and staff to continue working to pursue the mandate of the Caribbean Development Bank. Mr. President, we are facing major headwinds or more appropriately, crises created not by ourselves, but by external forces beyond our control. These crises are due to the lingering negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, the raging Russian-Ukraine war, imported inflation, and structural deficiencies in our economies. There is the need to measure, target, and eventually eliminate these deficiencies. Mr. Mr. President, this situation of crisis, if not halted, can have, the, can have the capability of increasing poverty and despair among the people of the region and further eroding their quality of life. It is important that you create avenues and opportunities to build resilient economies for the benefit of our people. The CDB has estimated that building resilient economies will require substantial financial resources of at least US $1 billion annually to help us achieve our developmental targets. Let me suggest that these figures may increase if the present global situation further deteriorates. The reality is that if we are to achieve these financing goals, the bank will have to access adequate and affordable finance underpinning a partnership for development that includes a regional, international, private, and public sector and developmental partners, as well as other multilateral banks. And, and allow me to congratulate the president of the CDB for the strategic alliance being forged with the African Development Bank. This is timely and a necessary intervention. Raising this machine finance we require new and innovative financial instruments and improved regulatory and, procure and procurement infrastructure and greater integration of financial markets in our region. In this regard, I await the innovative and thought and thought promoted by the CDB in the formulation of the recovery duration adjuster, RDE, as a replacement for the present valuation method of our vulnerabilities. It is clear that traditional income measurements are inadequate for our small island development states. I believe that our development focus must be holistic and improve the lives and livelihoods of our women, differently able, and the youth. In this regard, I urge states to focus on the economic well-being of our young people. 
the government of St. Lucia has created a special place in our economy for youth entrepreneurship and business growth within the general economic system to be pursued in the immediate future. In that space, youth will be provided with the state resources to help them convert hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into business through finance and marketing support, training and mentorship, thus creating sustainable livelihoods and a new cadre of indigenous business people. A dedicated agency which is agile, flexible and responsive is being created to drive that policy. Ladies and gentlemen, I have confidence in the ability of the President of the Caribbean Development Bank. I urge management and staff to continue striving in the pursuit of practical solutions to the problems of our region. Remember, we are resilient and innovative people and just as capable as any other nations of improving the quality of life for our people. I pledge my support and that of the Board of Governors and Directors to the work of the bank and to the people of our region. I would like to thank the non-borrowing member countries for their confidence and their continued investment in our bank. Let us unite to chart a course of sustainable growth for our people. The region depends on your continued leadership, particularly in these trying times, as we strive to attain the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. It was the St. Lucian economist and Nobel Prize laureate, Sir Arthur Lewis, who said, and I quote, education is the great growth industry of the world. Let us measure better, target better, and educate better. I thank you. On behalf of the Board of Governors, I'd like to move this resolution to express its appreciation for the kind hospitality of the government and people of Turks and Caicos Islands on the occasion of the 50, 52nd 2022 annual meeting held in the Turks and Caicos Islands. I so move. Are those in favor? Thank you so very much, Governor. Before you leave, As media, Camille are, Camille, are you ready? Yeah, we're ready for you now. She has a photo. Of. Where do you want us to take? Where do you want us to be? Where you take this? Can we come down? President? Chair? Sure. Vice President.
So I'm just going to bring this to you. Okay. All right. Thank you so very much. All right. So, directors and governors, we now return to regular order. And I thank you for your indulgence. Um, uh, at this stage, I am going to be calling on the president of the bank, President uh, Ihajenis Leon, to bring brief remarks. So, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Although I did hear you announce you were no longer chair, but obviously you are still chair. Uh, <laughs> which, um, if I can just sidebar to governors, uh, is because the new chair or the chair elect has has to leave, and so we had to have that change just to accommodate him. And so Premier Misek will continue as chair until at least the closing of uh, of this um, ceremony. As a first premier, it is uh, with a sense of tremendous satisfaction and optimism. And yes, if I can say uh, a tinge of sadness that I am delivering the closing remarks for the 52nd annual meeting of the Caribbean Development Bank. Uh, Chair, I, I first wish to thank you for agreeing to host the meeting in your little slice of paradise. You and your team have worked tirelessly to make this meeting a success and have been extremely accommodating and gracious in meeting our needs. Of course, the tinge of sadness is that we have to leave paradise, even though I think we all committed as of last night to come back. The discussions with governors as well as the seminars that were held over the past two weeks have not only provided food for thought, but have also showcased the wealth of talent in the Caribbean and the passion in our people to see the region excel, particularly among the youth, or what I prefer to call the future leaders. Uh, from all accounts, the William G. DeMas lecture delivered this year by President of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akinumi Adishina, was a resounding success. I especially appreciated his illustration of the AFDB's vision for Africa while providing a practical example of the economic and social transformation that is possible when visionary leadership is coupled with robust resource mobilization and the institutional capacity to implement projects and policy reforms. We are looking forward to working with the AFDB, having cemented our relationship with the execution of a memorandum of understanding during this meeting. It is high time that Africa and the Caribbean form partnerships for inclusive and sustainable development. Governors, as we have heard repeatedly over the past few days, and indeed elsewhere, the development prospects for our region are in peril. Before we can get a handle on one crisis, another emerges. I need not remind us that last year it was COVID and a volcano. This year it is COVID, the Russia-Ukraine war, and the 2022 Atlantic season that beckons to hit with potentially increasing severe systems. We must move swiftly to a state where these exogenous shocks are but temporary glitches on the radar, rather than seemingly permanently compromising the chance for inclusive and sustainable development. We must be able to respond and recover in the shortest possible time so as to minimize the impact on livelihoods. As I reflect on the state of affairs in the region, and the urgency with which we must act, combined with the insightful and intuitive exchanges over the past few days, 
I am compelled to share a few parting thoughts which we must keep at the forefront of our minds as we move forward with deliberate haste to create the future we have imagined, propelled by resilience and innovation. First, the quantum of resources needed by the region to evolve a resilient ecosystem is only daunting if we see it as our individual responsibility to mobilize. Instead, I take this opportunity to reiterate that if we form the Coalition for Development, pulling our joint capacities, mobilizing funds from multiple sources, traditional and non-traditional, then it is not only possible, it is probable that we can increase investment in the region to the levels required. Second, as we chart a way forward to more fairly determine access to affordable financing, I am reminded of SDG 8, which calls for us to develop a global partnership for development with targets related to the channeling of official development assistance. Governors meeting those targets related to ODA will be of no value if access to affordable finance is determined purely by gross national income. In fact, we believe it will only succeed in perpetuating inequality. As demonstrated during our seminar on measuring resilience and vulnerability, the recovery duration adjuster and more broadly, the internal resilience capacity is the answer that we need to embrace. I therefore thank the board for its support in pioneering this bold and innovative initiative. And we look forward to infusing this tool into our programming. Third, and in keeping with our thrust for innovation, we must dare to be different and flexible. In this sense, we must be able to increasingly mobilize significant private sector financing for development. Finally, as one of the oldest and one of the most impactful regional public goods, CDB is only as strong and as effective as our members and their collective voices. We remain deeply grateful for the confidence reposed in the bank as illustrated in the statements made by respective governors yesterday. I strongly urge that now is the time to make those voices louder. In this vein, I intend to deepen my engagement with our board of directors and board of governors, and this I want to give you as a pledge. I will reach out to each and every one of you individually and jointly such that we can mobilize, mobilize that coordination, that collaboration that we can bring when we meet as a group to effect what I think all of us want, the development of this region. Recognizing directors and governors that every member of CDB brings value to this organization and that that value, that collaboration is critical to the delivery of our mandate. To outgoing Chair Premier Charles Washington Misick, as I know he likes to be called, your unbounded passion for TCI and this region has made you one of our strongest advocates. And we know that we can continue to rely on your support. And to our incoming chair in absentia, Prime Minister of St. Lucia, uh, Philip J. Pierre, we eagerly look forward to working with you to craft and execute your vision for your coming tenure as chairman of the Board of Governors. Governors, let us use this 52nd meeting as a sort of démarche a signal of recommitment, a signal of refocus, and a signal of resolve. 
supported by capable and competent staff to whom I am exceedingly grateful, I know CDB is ready and CDB will deliver. Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And Marcus Gavi said, with confidence, you have won before you have started. Let us therefore go forward with confidence and create our best future. Thank you. Continuing to wind down, we want to call the... Um, oh, I can do my remarks now. Okay. I'll just go and... Good morning again. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President, for your kind remarks and and for the remarks of all those who've spoken before during the course of this meeting and uh, have actually highlighted the, the the thanks to Turks and Caicos Islands for holding this uh, this conference. Uh, on behalf of the the. Um, Overseas territories in the Caribbean, Anguilla, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, Montserrat, Turks and Caicos Islands. I am pleased to bring my final comments. Facing our reason, face unprecedented challenges. And it is right and proper that we engage with a mindset to bring solution to, to as many of these problems as we can. As the incoming chairman said only a few minutes ago, many, if not most, of these challenges are exogenous. They are not of our making, but nevertheless, we have to confront them and deal with them. And so the, the thrust of this meeting, uh, the, the theme, measuring better to target better, I believe is the right approach to have taken. And many of us will leave here with an addition to our vocabulary. Uh, many of us would have heard of of the internal resilience capacity, which I understand to be the, the bedrock for the RDA, the recovery duration adjuster, uh, as, an, uh, as the CDB approach to a new measurement for our member borrowing countries and, and other countries globally with the same set of circumstances. And so, um, if nothing else, I think we've come away with a, with a new appreciation for the gap and how difficult it is uh, to measure and to uh, close that gap. Uh, I think that generally speaking, I think I speak for all when I said the meetings have been productive, provocative, and impactful as we together as governors and directors in the bank look forward to reimagining the future of the bank, but also reimagining the future of our region. And so uh, I think together we are hopeful that the results of the results that in the, uh, that it will be a a, a more responsive rate um, and more collaboration between BMCs in the region and our development partners uh, and non-barring um, countries both in the region and out of the region. The Dimas lecture delivered by the president of the African Development Bank was special very eye-opening, 
sometimes some things are very obvious, but they still need to be said. And I believe this was a very fresh voice, and this is part of the impactfulness that I will take away from this 52nd meeting. In closing, I think the key, the key word that is going to make a difference, both in terms of planning and the implementation, is this whole idea of partnership, which I believe uh, and has been restated here, is key to, the, to advance the development of our region. This uh, collaboration or partnership, <clears throat> as I said earlier, is going to be required both regionally and extra-regionally. And I, uh, I am I'm grateful for the leadership of the president and the new thrust as it relates to trying to identify uh, new sources of financing and how that is broken down uh, to make sure that it hits the right places and does the right things at the right time. And so um, the alignment of our national budget with the SDGs also came through. The need to align our budget with the SDGs also came through very clearly in the presentations, both by uh, the bank itself, but also by the contributing governors. That said, I would like to give a big shout out to all of the participants, to all of you who've come to the Turks and Caicos. Uh, as I said, this is your home away from home. I hope you've enjoyed the hospitality of the islands. Um, last night was a little bit over the top, even for me, but it, it may speak more to my age bracket than anything else. But I hope you enjoyed it. It was a taste of Caribbean culture and to my own team here on the ground, and also to the CDB team who've actually held our hands and been very active uh, in the planning over the last few months. I wanna say you did a fantastic job and we thank you very, very much. So again, thank you, thank you. Great to have had you and Mr. President, you have my word that Turks and Caicos Islands and the British Overseas Territories together we will continue to be engaged with the bank and to do everything we can to ensure that it remains an effective and impactful public good for our region. Thank you very much. Okay, we moving right along. We'll now have a presentation by Spark. And that means what experience spouses. Okay. Oh, she'll, she'll explain what it is. Yeah. Good day, everyone. I am Brenda Thomas. I am not from the bank, but I am closely associated with one of the principals there. And um, <laughs> today I want to briefly summarize some highlights of a detailed document that you would have received uh, in your package. I hope that you'll take some time to read it um, in detail. I'll tell you a little bit about Spark, the network and how it can help support your development agenda. And on behalf of Spark, I want to seek your enthusiastic support for the project idea that we are going to pursue. 
So, ah, okay. So, Spark is spouses and partners advocating regional cooperation. A core group has already met and um, has already been meeting over the last few months. The First Lady Delphia of TCI was our very first ally in this project. I am trying to go back. Okay. So the concept of Spark is to leverage our platforms as spouses and partners and unleash our incredible energy to help amplify the bank's development agenda by engaging and inspiring our citizens, advocating for change, partnering with governments and civil society, and supporting the implementation of solutions. In other words, we want to bring some spark and light a fire to help advance the bank's development thrust across the region. We plan to champion a number of projects, some of them multi-year, and we strongly encourage you to take advantage of this newly activated force and look forward to your support. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the project. Uh, we considered nine project ideas and we settled on this one, which is using smart technology and innovation to support food security. Even on a micro level, we think it is important to emphasize technology and innovation to engage and capture the imagination of our citizens, especially the younger members of our society. So I'll give you a little bit of a background uh, for the project. I think this is okay. I think my finger is a little bit too um, quick or the clicker is a little bit sensitive. But um, to give you some background, the context that we are focusing um, for the project would be very familiar to you. Food security is very much the topic uh, these days across, across the region. Global events have exacerbated food access and supply chains. We face a multitude of um, diverse agricultural challenges in the region. CARICOM, of course, has just recently committed to reducing the food import bill by 25%. And CDB has this five pillar development agenda that is anchored on sustainability and resilience. Uh, three of which are productive capacity resilience, social resilience, and env environmental resilience. So this project is very timely. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the goals of the project. So we've settled on two goals for this initiative. One is to engage primary and secondary school students in researching and applying technology in their school gardens by 2023. And the second goal is to pilot a multimodal agri-tech agri program in seven member countries in 2024 and scale it to 12 member countries in 2025. And by multimodal, we mean all of the above, hydroponics, aquaponics, vertical farms, small scale greenhouses, raised beds, and even approaches we don't know yet. So the idea is to try many things, learn as much as we can, learn what works, analyze and use the data to scale up to uh, a larger um, program. In terms of our milestones, in the first year, the focus will be on assessing needs and building partnerships within ministries, within schools, community organizations. In the second year, the focus will be on implementing the pilot program and collecting and analyzing data. And in the third year, the plan is to scale up to a total of 12 countries driven by the lessons learned in the pilot. Financing. 
So everything takes money uh, so and you know time and resources. So we've suggested some options for propelling this initiative forward. Governors, we encourage you to embed and champion this initiative in your broader food security initiative. We um, recommend that you allocate some funding in your current budgets in the meantime. And importantly, give this some lift by appointing a ministerial function to drive execution. On the CDB side, we recommend CDB uh, arrange some technical assistance as this naturally aligns uh, with some of its key focus areas. Provide a digital platform to enable collaboration and support um, of the regional digital hackathon that we're proposing to solve thorny problems. And also integrate this project with its Knowledge Hub initiative. So a peek into what's next. Um, we think this project is a natural follow-on to the digital warehousing, scientific discovery, and industrialization of medic medicinal herbs and tropical plants. So we are looking forward to supporting genome sequencing as a building block for a regional pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industry. I think the cultural artists last night probably had a sense of what we were going to do. So we're going to go to the bush, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> so in Spark, you have uh, strong allies who are willing to help elevate awareness and understanding of the development issues, amplify messaging among our citizens, advocate for policy change, align successes and knowledge bases across the region, and connect organizations to form partnerships. And also collaborate to implement uh, initiatives, projects, and activities. Thank you very much for the time for us to present this to you. And thank you very much for your enthusiastic and concrete support. Okay, um, we have a final presentation, the uh, presentation on indigenous community. At the Caribbean Development Bank, we thrive to ensure the prosperity of all we serve. Inclusion is at the heart of what we do. At the bank, we serve all and preserve the interest of each and every individual by investing in all our people. Through strong collaborations with our development partners, driven by client-focused interventions, we continue to invest in our heritage and our indigenous culture to empower all our people by partnering to build and transform. We harness our rich and diverse Caribbean assets and knowledge to create novel, innovative, income-generating opportunities for our varied clientele. In Suriname, the women and girls of a rural cooperative received assistance from the EU to monetize traditional meals. This enabled them to take control of their futures and better provide for their families by combining their knowledge of plants and production to improve capacity and create a high-end product. In Belize, we are working with Mayan women who are artists, community scholars, and change agents to accelerate and innovate new designs and develop culturally appropriate branding with the support of our Cultural and Creative Industries Fund, SIF. Here, digital platforms provide greater access and integration for their creative products, handwoven embroidered pieces, into the global market. Also in Belize, we are supporting an indigenous farming collective to access greater revenue along the cacao and chocolate value chain by improving the processing standards and quality of their yields and to increase their earnings. We are constantly seeking new opportunities to provide economic empowerment and support sustainable development of all communities while honoring and safeguarding cultural heritage, knowledges and practices. We remain committed to helping each member of the Caribbean community integrate into the global economy and enjoying an improved standard of living by providing tailor-made projects for individuals, groups and organizations. We continue to thrive to create the best future for all the citizens of our region. 
One Caribbean, one CDB. Before we bring the meeting to its final close, I'm going to give the president the final word. Thank you, Chair. I just want to, before I say a final thank you to everyone uh, for your not just constructive, but modern enthusiastic support and sidebar conversations over the last uh, couple of days. I, I wanted to just add a couple of comments on the two presentations we've just had. Uh, because they are not the norm and uh, we need a little context. And the first, maybe let me start with the last one, the short video you saw of the indigenous peoples of the, of the region. Uh, and that's to give you again as governors the, the first preview of where we are looking to go. And I say looking to go because we were inspired coming out of a mission in Belize that the voice of the indigenous peoples of the region have not been advocated sufficiently. We have a number of talented indigenous peoples, whether it's in tanning, in embroidery, in sculpture, in metalwork, in whatever, many, many small areas living in different areas across the region, the Dominicas, the Guatemalas, the Belizes, and so on, the St. Vincents, some of them under the title of Garifunas and other pure indigenous peoples who are undertaking a number of skilled activities, struggling in most cases to maintain sustainable livelihoods and whose skills are more than likely to be maybe lost over time or not made sufficiently um, strong to provide for a leveraging of those from an economic empowerment standard. And so we came up with the idea that we should host an international conference on indigenous peoples of the region. And I've already had conversations with the United Nations Development uh, Program for them to partner with us in putting through this particular conference. But it is not just a conference that we are looking to do. What we are envisaging is something bigger. And it goes something simple like this. What if, what if we could provide training and certification that could attest to the authenticity of indigenous production methods in all of the fields that we are talking about. What if that certification or authenticity could now be leveraged through a platform? And we spoke yesterday about she trades, but something similar to she trades that could allow for the marketing of those products globally under a brand name of authenticity of the indigenous peoples of the region? What if we could talk about, through certification, the ability to say that the indigenous skills could be promoted and given longevity and sustainability, and at the same time provide for sustainable livelihoods of those communities going forward? And what could we leverage from this cultural integration that would ensue from bringing all of the indigenous peoples into one space. And that becomes, in essence, one way of CDB demonstrating its inclusiveness in development, leaving no one behind promoting the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. And so rather than wait to tell you next year, that this is something we did. I thought it would have been a tremendous opportunity to give you a sneak preview 
that there is, as governors, there is a potential out there to begin to mobilize talent, to begin to generate diversification, to begin to promote the authenticity of the work of the indigenous peoples while we promote sustainable livelihoods. So that was the, the rationale for that little clip that you had to give you an idea of one of the initiatives that we intend to drive forward. The, the second presentation you had, which was the first uh, on Spark, was an idea coming from, uh, shall I say, First Lady Delphia and uh, wife. She says she has associations with uh, certain principles <laughs> um, that maybe we can do a little more in galvanizing support. And we have not just governors, alternate governors, directors, and alternate directors, let's just call them now the existing talent and advocacy pool around the table, but they all have spouses or partners. And even when they have neither spouse nor partners, there is room for a person representing them of whatever persuasion, whatever institutional affiliation you may want to choose. But if we can pair up each director, governor, and the alternates by mobilizing someone associated with them, then we automatically double the support base that we have to help drive the development of the region. And so they came up with the idea that we would form this group. And so today we've seen the beginning of that group and they're looking to mobilize spouses or representatives of directors, governors, to help build, as it were, a back office group that can help champion, help advocate for, help mobilize uh, across whatever areas of um, support that they can muster to give impetus, to give strength to the work that the bank is doing. And so that's the idea behind Spark. Spark does not exist to go out there and do. They cannot. And as uh, one of the slides says, they have no finance to do that. And we are not asking for finance to do that. It is how can we integrate that support of army of volunteers within the work that we are already doing such that we can double up. You get two for one, essentially, is the principle that we are talking about here to help drive the agenda going forward. And so what they did over the last two, three months is to sit and caucus and come up with some ideas and they thought again, in keeping with the recent idea to push food security, maybe one way we could do this is to focus on the food security idea, linking it with not the production efforts that are being undertaken through the government or the focus on the government of Guyana in Guyana for the region. But now let's target the future of agriculture, our schools, our youth. Is there a way we can integrate within that space as part of one course on a curriculum, elements of agriculture that kids can begin to grow something at school as part of their education, that they can learn about the benefits of nutrition, that they can become preventive in the health sphere, targeting one of the areas of non-communicable diseases that is becoming a problem for the region. If we can begin to do this, spur them into beginning to think like the African Development Bank um, has promoted over the last few years, becoming agripreneurs, seeing agriculture as something that is more than subsistence peasant living but something that can create wealth, that can give them a future that they can want to work towards, that becomes a noble purpose that we can advocate for. 
And all it would take is for our governments, represented through you, to encourage through our ministries of education, through our school system, the adoption of something like this. And you can give legs to how that initiative can begin to grow. It may grow small, one school, one country, but what if we could gradually scale this up? More schools in one country, more schools across countries. SPAC has a, an objective of 12 school, 12 countries by 2024. That's a goal, and we like to think big. But if we end up with two, it will be two more than we have now. And if we end up with five schools, it's five more than we have now. And what it means is in the next five years, we have five more agri-minded people than we have now. And so what I'd like to be able to do is to encourage you, uh, one, to speak with your authorities. Um, we have a group that is willing to help advocate, to help uh, bring together to help drive to help assist uh, and so we need to be able to use them but equally the group is now small as with all things that, that happen you start small because you cannot get everyone to uh, be and get on the same page immediately it takes a little time so we want to encourage let's share the telephone numbers email addresses of all of either your spouses your um, partners or somebody who you think can represent you such that i can assure you the members of spark would be happy to make the calls send the emails start speaking and they've done everything they've done so far virtually that's the benefit of covid all of this can be done virtually you can arrange calls, arrange meetings, discuss, work without the need for a physical meeting. And so the issue of cost, the issue of money begins secondary. And let's think of it more as how do we redeploy, how do we encourage, how do we manage within what we already have to help move this agenda going forward. So that's my um, closing uh, plea for you here, that you, you see this um, initiative in this light as a contributing, complementary act to the work that you do here at the board level, whether it's the board of governors or the board of directors. And so with that, um, I don't know if Premier, I'm going to leave the last word to you, but I just want to again put on record my um, sincere thanks and appreciation, uh, not just for everything we've done here in TCI, but the continuing work that you are doing, uh, all the work that you have done as a collective body, and that I'm looking forward to, to working with you. We have a lot of work to do, and we have no option but to get our ultimate, ultimate best. Thank you very much. Yeah. It is my task, I was going to say pleasure, but it is my task now uh, to declare the 52nd 2022 meeting of the Board of Governors of the Car Caribbean Development Bank concluded. Thank you. <laughs>